So the theme of this retreat is the deeper intent of the heart, what it is that is really most important to us in our life. And um, it's a pretty serious question. And when I was writing notes of what I wanted to share with you this morning, I felt that my my heart it was just sort of getting deeper and more and more intense because I just came from a week of silent meditation retreat in the mountains with uh, my Tibetan friend um, Anam Tukten and so everything becomes more amplified when the mind is quiet and very attentive, alert, engaged with experience. And I noticed yesterday that Leela told, uh, she told a couple of jokes, one particularly I think stuck in our minds that we heard toward the end of the day. And, I'm not. <laughs> and if you want to know what people are laughing at, you just have to come to both days of retreat next time. Um, but then Anam Tupten, he told a joke. I think you probably should be Tibetan to tell this joke. So you can imagine that you know, I'm him. There's a picture of him right out there. Um, but he told this joke about a contest that happened between the different countries and nationalities. Uh, that there was a, I mean, in my mind it's a monastery, but it probably wasn't. But some place that had fallen into disrepair and, um, and all of these goats from the mountains had taken shelter there and they'd kind of taken over the space. So it was very, shall we say, um, odiferous inside. And so there was a contest to see uh, which people could tolerate that smell the longest. And, you know, first the Americans went in and they could they, they could stand it. They stayed in for about three and a half minutes. <laughs> and then they came out and then some um, some English people went in and they stayed in about five minutes and then they came out. Then some French people went in. They, I don't know, maybe because of their cheeses and things, they could stay in there for about seven minutes and then they just came pa bursting out, <gasps> trying to you know catch their breath. And then um, the Tibetans went in and after about a minute and a half, all the goats came out. <laughs> so, as I said, you maybe need to be Tibetan really to tell that story. <laughs> but, um, I guess they didn't have a lot of running water. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so what does that have to do with the deeper intent of the heart? It's really, studies have shown that when we are um, in a positive frame of mind, either we laugh or maybe we're experiencing some gratitude or appreciation or thinking of somebody we love, that actually our whole consciousness is sort of softer and more open and more open to learning and people learn better. And since this particular format is actually probably the least effective learning format where it was kind of like a lecture and listening, but because of meditation, our minds are softer and more receptive to learning than they would be if we were, I don't know, had just schlepped ourselves out on Sunday morning to a regular class, perhaps. Um, and I think this question of what it is we're really longing for in this life is so important and oddly enough we take so little time to actually stop and reflect on that even though it's so important and I don't mean from the sense of you know a purpose-driven life what is your mission statement um, I mean that's important too on one level but I actually mean something that's a little bit softer and deeper as we were talking about yesterday um, a vulnerability and compassion. Compassion makes us vulnerable by definition when we open our hearts to feeling how it is for other creatures, for other beings. 
and for ourselves. And so it's more that inclination toward <clears throat> self-compassion and self-care. And it's not selfish to do this. In fact, uh, we know that it's a kind of paradoxical <coughs> phenomenon, but it is actually easier to let go of things that we are not struggling with, that we don't hate about ourselves or somebody else. Um, and it's counterintuitive because, for example, if you think about, say, a kid leaving home. I know they don't really leave home anymore, but um, <laughs> just think of the old days when they used to leave home. Or maybe when they're going off to college, they leave home for a while. And um, you would think that the people who've had the most distressing home life, you know, where things are just really unhappy at home and maybe there's neglect or worse, an impaired parent, who knows, but really difficult situation that um, that those kids who are actually dying to get out of the house and often will marry young or you know join the army, the military, do something to get out of the house, that they will have the easiest time letting go of their home life. And that the kids who have such a sweet family and it's tender and mom or somebody does the laundry and there's meals and it's all very um, kind of peaceful and loving and that it would be, I mean, why would anybody ever want to leave? A situation like that, right? Um, but it turns out that people who've grown up in a reasonably protected and safe, um, reasonably loving family actually do better moving on and leaving home than the people who are dying to get out because it's so painful often have a much harder time uh, <coughs> really leaving and getting some momentum and traction in their lives and moving on. And the same, I think, is true for us, that the parts of ourselves, the things that we're least comfortable with, that we would most like to get rid of or annihilate or somehow, you know, excise, have a, uh, I don't know, a fear or anxiety ectomy, you know, get, somehow get rid of these things that are most tormenting to us, um, that that very impulse to get rid of, to get aggressive with it, or just have this turn away in aversion to that. Oddly enough, um, I think the expression is what we resist persists. You know, oddly enough, it's harder to let go of the things that we actually might even hate about ourselves. You'd think it would be easy, but it isn't. So this is one of the reasons um, for our hearts to become as self-compassionate as possible. Because when we have some understanding and some, uh, you know, it's kind of like there's somebody, maybe they bug you and they really irritate you. And you can't put your finger on it. And then through some circumstance, you hear their story and you realize where they are coming from and what they have lived through to come to this place and maybe even why they are so annoying. <laughs> suddenly it becomes <clears throat> clear, right? And we just suddenly soften and there isn't that sense of resistance or separation to that person anymore. We still might not choose to hang out with them all the time, but we have a different, we're not dwelling in aversion. So it's the same with ourselves, that when we can come to have some tenderness or understanding of how we come to be the way we are, and it doesn't mean that we have to go into years of psychoanalysis or psychotherapy and trace back every single thing that happened in our childhood. Um, I mean, that might be helpful. I'm not against it uh, at all, having worked for 25 years as a psychotherapist, um, understanding the causes and conditions and you know, the, the, um, how our patterns get created can be a very important way to have compassion for them when we understand, oh, okay, when I was five years old, that was really the best way to be in my family. Now that I'm 35, it isn't working quite as well in my relationships anymore. 
55. Uh, 55, <laughs> yes. <laughs> 65, <laughs> and so on. Um, but I think that uh, the deepest intention, what brings everybody here, is a kind of yearning or longing to know more deeply who and what we are and who and what this life is to strengthen our capacity for awareness, insight, clarity, for love, understanding, compassion, these qualities that we sometimes call spiritual, but I just call them human. We really want to strengthen these qualities so that um, we can protect whatever it is in our life that gives rise to them. Where did these qualities, just take a moment and reflect, you know, where did these qualities really seem to flower or blossom um, in your life? Is it when you are able to spend some quiet time with yourself, when you spend time with somebody you love, when you're in nature? Just take a moment and really just ask yourself, where does it seem that my heart opens? or that really these, um, I feel more loving and more willing to understand other people and so forth. There are so many. Hmm? Oh. Who would like to say, Leela just said, ask them to tell you. I thought, well, we made up the silence rule. We can make up that you're allowed to tell us, right? Um, what came up for you? What is a context when, yeah. When um, I'm, I'm in spiritual practice. When you're doing spiritual practice. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Helping others. I didn't hear you. Helping others. Helping yeah. others, yeah. Wonderful. Morning. I, I shared a laugh with my husband this morning, and to, to share humor with someone that's known you for decades mm -hmm. is incredibly. <laughs> <laughs> so, being able to laugh with somebody you know really well. So that movement of kind of dropping out of the head and the mind and letting yourself be with your heart, go inside, be with your heart, yeah, thank you. I relate to each one of these as um, very, very, it, it's a combination of enlivening and inspiring somehow. And it's so important to find the doorways to that, the ways that we can take care of our hearts and have access to these dimensions of our experience, which are really our birthright as human beings, to have access to these dimensions of our experience. Um, and <clears throat> one of the things that I've found really helpful for myself is to see if I can look at life and people in my life and events of life as one way would be saying seeing it as my teacher but seeing where I can learn and just as you were reflecting what is the context that supports this opening of the heart or the blossoming of these qualities um, for me, being able to look at a situation as, even a situation I would never have chosen, but be able to look at it as an opportunity to grow, to maybe grow in love and understanding. Um, when I was going through a really horrible time, before I came to L.A., uh, a 
friend said, oh, just think how much this is going to help you be so much more compassionate for <laughs> everyone else's suffering. And, you know, my heart was completely broken. I was totally devastated. And I said, you know, I think I was pretty compassionate before. Um, I'm not sure I needed this. And yet it turned out to be true. You know, there was just a level of suffering that I hadn't... Um, ever experienced or exposed myself to because whoever would willingly. Uh, and yet, it was true that um, the ability to experience that much more um, brought a certain kind of strength and confidence and ability to bear that much more <laughs> that life might present in the form of somebody who comes to me or somebody um, that I encounter. And what we're doing here when we do this simple practice, you know, as Leela was saying, just come back to awareness. Uh, whatever you're experiencing is okay. It all sounds very benign and benevolent, and yet it's very challenging to do. And every time we are willing to be aware of exactly what is happening in this mind, heart, body, um, environment. Every time we're willing, we are actually growing in courage to meet experience and to meet each experience of life that, that may come to us. And it might not seem like a big deal to be lost in thought. I mean, the mind is such a storyteller. It's so creative. Uh, you know, Leela's a writer, and I always say, well, I'm not a writer. But then I sit and meditate, and I just see these stories that are being generated. and So imaginative, right? And don't you imagine the most hideous things that you would never want to have happen, and the most amazing things that may never, and so forth and so on. It goes on and on and on. I don't know how many novels and Anyway, it's definitely not, uh, it's fiction, you know, it's definitely <laughs> fiction writing. Um, the mind can really go on and on with this. And what this practice is doing as we become aware of that is we start to see, uh, we start to see that process, first of all, of how much of the experience that we're living in is mind generated, is actually fiction, is a kind of virtual reality. Uh, that we're inhabiting. We also start to see the way that uh, the tendency that we have to take possession or ownership of awareness. Um, this is, I'm aware of my experience, this is about me, I'm the star of all of these stories, aren't you the star of yours? Pretty much, and we start to see that process too. And it's important because that sense of ownership or possession um, of what's happening, that illusory control over what's happening, well, it is illusory and it isn't true. And it's like trying to own and grab onto and fixate and make solid something that is flowing and alive and moving and ever changing. And if we're to truly take good care of ourselves, to see what's real. I was on the Ferris wheel with my grandson earlier this year. He's turning eight later this month, but so he was probably right in the middle of being seven. And as you know, the Santa Monica Ferris wheel, it's tall and it goes over the ocean and it stops to let people on. So at one point we were actually suspended way up high. It had stopped there because people were climbing onto one of the uh, little, I don't know what you call them, those places you sit in at the bottom, little carriages or something. And so we were suspended way up high and it's actually feeling, when I'm in the Ferris wheel, I like it. I couldn't rock climb or something, but being held, it, I like that feeling. And he, his eyes were wide open, and he just looked at me, and he said, Nini, which is my grandmother nickname, um, he said, Nini, is this real? <laughs> it was a genuine question he had, like being <sighs> suspended in space. Are we really here? Is this really happening? Mm -hmm. And I said, what do you think? He said, I don't know. <laughs> 
I don't know. And I thought it was so honest, you know, because how many, we could actually ask ourselves that question at different points. And I said, well, you know, they say that if you're in a dream and you pinch yourself, you'll know if you're dreaming or not, if you wake up. And he thought about that one for a while. And then he said, actually, you know, you could pinch yourself in a dream. <laughs> and I thought, that's true. <laughs> then when are we really waking up? You know, what is really going on here? So the courage and the willingness to ask ourselves these questions, what is most real to me? When do I feel closest to what's true or real? for myself? When do you feel closest to what's true or real for you? Um, having the courage to not take for granted our experience because it's familiar, but to look at the familiar with maybe some fresh or unfamiliar eyes. Uh, the wonderful novelist, um, I think our Chilean or Argentinian, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, where um, Colombian. Colombian, thank you. Um, he was talking about his wife, Mercedes, and he said, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the exact quote, but he said, I've lived with her for so long that I don't know who she is anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, it was such a, can we have that kind of approach to that which we know so well? Like, what is this actually that we're involved in here? What is this life? What is it? Um, and we learn as we sit here together through all the ups and downs of the heart and mind and our internal lives, our external lives, the joys and sorrows, the successes and tragedies. Somebody this morning told me that she's a happiness and success coach. And I thought, what a great thing to be. And yet, I know uh, others who are sitting here work with people at the bottom of their lives, the most tragic moments. And as we go through all of this landscape of our lives and come back to being more and more present with it, we practice being more and more, in a sense, unflappable that we can meet an experience, be present with it, without veering off into our fears about it or our wishes for it to be different, that we can do that simple instruction that Leela gave of just, can we just be with it? It's okay, whatever it is. No matter what the level of intensity of it, it can be okay. One of my favorite stories, um, from the Tibetan tradition that um, Anand Thupten told. He likes to tell it. I like this story. It's a story about Patro Rinpoche, a great Tibetan Buddhist teacher. And he was in a meditation retreat, just like we're in today, except he was in a solo retreat. Instead of having the support of each other, the way we do, being here together, he was in some cave all by himself up in the mountains and he had chosen that isolated spot so that in a way he was inviting his various demons and whatever was he really wanted to learn about himself in a challenging situation and his teacher was teaching him just what we're learning here can you be present with experience whatever it is without being you know ha having it knock your socks off one way or the other and so he was in his cave, and he's meditating, and he's meditating, and you know things get amplified when you sit with yourself in silence. Have you ever noticed this? Mm -hmm. And he had a kind of, it was like a nightmare, but it wasn't asleep. It was a sort of vision, it was a frightening fantasy of that the whole valley was filling with uh, waves and water, like a flood was coming, these huge waves, and everything was flooded, mm -hmm. and, um, um, and Oh yeah, and a dragon came, and um, it was this huge dragon, and it was terrifying. And he sat through it. He sat through it. And he didn't move, he didn't run up, he didn't scream, he sat through it. And he saw, he deeply understood, 
this is a projection of my own mind. You know, this is like a dream when you're asleep. And uh, Leela woke up this morning and she said, oh, I dreamed I was walking on water. <laughs> I thought, she does walk on water, actually. <laughs> That's how I feel about her. But anyway, but she isn't going to, you know, jump off the Santa Monica Pier and imagine <laughs> she can really walk on the water. Are you? No. <laughs> so that's the difference. You know, we understand it's a projection of our mind. So Patra Rinpoche, he understood, was, even though he wasn't, it was a projection of his mind. And so he sat through his terror and he just sat quietly and then it subsided and he calmed down. And then after he calmed down and he was sitting some more, you know, he'd done some walking meditation and then he came back and he sat down again. And then suddenly, this person showed up with um, offerings for him. And they brought some milk and some rice, and, um, uh, and they brought him a whole bucket of yogurt. And, you know, it was delicious. And he thought, oh, this is, a kind, this is like my good, good karma in a way, my uh, reward for having sat through that nightmare and seen that it was a projection of my mind and you know this is my reward and he was quite happy and pleased and then he went to meet with his teacher and he said to his teacher um, you know I want to report my success to you he said like his success and happiness coach um, you could think of your teacher that way and he said he, he, you know I, this terrifying thing happened and I sat through it and I didn't budge he said, and then somebody came and had a bucket of yogurt, and you know, I was rewarded for this um, uh, this courage that I had and my ability to see that this was just a projection of my consciousness. And the teacher said, "Well, you passed the first test with flying colors, and you completely flunked the second one." <laughs> now, do you understand? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like. That, too, was a projection of his mind. But that one he chose to believe. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a, a wonderful story for us. Like, which ones do we choose to believe? Because there's a point in our mindfulness. We're mindful of this and mindful of that and mindful, right? And then suddenly, something catches us. And maybe some self-doubt maybe some self-criticism, that one sounds true, and we go with it, right? So, can the deepest intent of our heart be to see all of this, to see all of this, to see it all in the service of our growth in love and understanding, to see it all in our ability to appreciate the hugeness and the vastness of human experience internally and externally and to be able to hold more and more of that experience in that deep knowingness that we call awareness instead of turning away or numbing ourselves or but to really see all of it as a sacred a kind of sacred presentation of existence simply because it's here and it's appearing uh, it's spring you know so many things are blooming and in buds and appearing right now um, and so that's our our work here to be able to be with this stream of our whole life is a stream of momentary experience moment 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 experience of appearing, being born, dying, vanishing, appearing, living, having its being, disappearing, vanishing. So full, so rich, so full. And can we walk with and through all these experiences and walk side by side with ourselves as we go through each one of them? Because to the extent that we can walk side by side with ourselves in this appreciation and tenderness for who and what we are in this life, to that extent will we be able to offer that kind of presence to others. 
And we have sonar for that, for who has that kind of inner um, spaciousness of heart and inner welcome. We really do know. Children know, too. You know, they do. Infants know. We're mm -hmm. wired with this deep, deep knowingness um, that is our birthright. And the Buddha said very clearly, and we sometimes quote the Buddha as the um, inventor or discoverer of mindfulness practice, this great liberating practice that we're talking about this morning. And he said so clearly, the mind is naturally radiant, luminous, clear, calm, sane, and good. And everything else, he <coughs> called them adventitious visitors, just guests. So if you aren't, if you're caught in a moment, remember that wonderful U2 song, I'm stuck in a moment and I can't get out of it. If you're stuck in a moment where you aren't experiencing your heart and mind as radiant, clear, calm, sane, luminous, good, etc., understand that whatever else is obscuring or clouding your vision of yourself as being that is simply a guest in your life. It's a visitor. It's not the truth of who you are. So may the deeper intent of our hearts be to know this more and more clearly, more and more reliably about ourselves, because then it becomes true about how we see each other. So that's some of what I want to share with you this morning. Thank you. Let's just sit for a few minutes. <clears throat> 